For you who don't know me, I am Sandy Sedmack Angle. I am the chairman of the board for the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show. And we are super, super excited that you guys are here with us today. We hope that this short seminar is going to give you some valuable information about um, how to do a better job applying for not just our art show, but, you know, art shows across the country. Um, I'm, we're going to start with a couple of little requests. Like we said, if everyone could keep yourself muted, that would be super helpful. It's probably going to be more beneficial for you guys now that we've seen everybody's faces and everybody waved and said hi. Um, if you wanted to go ahead and put your um, Zoom setting into speaker view or just go on to my image and pin me. So then you'll be able to um, see me while I'm speaking. Um, and also, I'm assuming most of you guys are familiar with Zoom. As we go through this presentation, what we'd like you guys to do is go ahead and open up the chat room. Um, if anyone doesn't know how to do that on the bottom of your screen, there should be a little button that says chat. And when you open that up, you want to hit your, um, it says there, who can see your messages? You want that to say everyone in the meeting. So what we're going to do is we've got a couple of our board members here with us. We've got Sharon Strine, who on my Brady Bunch picture is right next to me. Sharon is my, um, my co-chair. So she's, she's here to help monitor the room and answer questions. And then we've also got Sarah Pollack, who um, is another board member of ours. Sarah does a lot of shows all over the country. So we wanted to have her here because she's got some really good insight, probably more insight than I do into doing outdoor shows because I'm, I'm mostly an East Coast kind of gal. So if you have questions as we're going along or there's something that you think of that you'd like us to cover later, please go ahead and type your question into the chat room. Um, is there anybody who doesn't know how to work chat? Everybody good on that? Okay, I'm seeing mostly thumbs up, so that's awesome. So then as we go along, if Sharon or Sarah can answer your questions, if it's a really simple yes. answer, they can just answer it in chat. So if everybody wants to have that open, you can listen to the presentation, look at the questions. And then as we go along, we'll stop once or twice to see if there's any questions that need to be addressed. And at the end, uh, we should have like 20 minutes, half an hour. We're going to try to keep this meeting till about an hour long um, to answer all the remaining questions that are left in chat. Sarah is going to kind of compile a list of, of um, the ones that she thinks need to be addressed the most, just in case we run out of time. And then, like I said, if we, if we have some extra time, we'll open it up and do a little live Q&A. Okay. Um, all righty. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. As I hope you all know, we are um, with the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show. Everybody see my screen? Can I get some thumbs up? Okay. I can't really see anyone. Sharon, Sarah, is everyone seeing my screen okay? Yes, we can see. Looks, looks good. All right. looks good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Well, like, like we said in our promotion of this event, we are calling this Demystifying Juring, the view from the other side of ZAP. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Outdoor Out Shows, you know that ZAP is Zapplication. Zapplication.org is um, an app site that most of the outdoor art shows, whether they're fine art craft shows all over the country, use to accept artists' applications. So um, it has become shortened to ZAP. And again, we are with the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show. 2022 is we are entering our 95th year, which we're incredibly proud of. We are the oldest outdoor fine art show in the country. Um, our show is consistently 
ranked um, as one of the top shows in the country in 2020. We were voted um, the number one fine art show in the country by Sunshine Artist Magazine, which was a huge honor for us because that, um, that award is voted on by artists who participate in shows. So that really, that really meant a lot to us. But we've been around a long time. Um, it's an amazing show. And hopefully we can help you. Uh-oh. This is wonderful. I did this 500 times and it worked and now my buttons aren't working. Hold on guys. There we go. Um, we are here to help you figure out if you're applying to shows and you're not getting in, why you're not getting in, maybe give you some insight. Um, if you're new to the world of art door out shows um, and you've never applied before, this is gonna give you some insight as to what the shows and the jurors look for. But we get um, at our shows and a lot of our, you know, artists that, that I've met, artists that, that have participated in our shows and then maybe don't get in one year or people have applied a couple times and they can't get in and they just don't understand um, why they aren't being accepted, not just to our show. You know, this, this is gonna kind of go for shows all across the country. Um, they think their work is strong. They consider themselves professional artists. So they just do, don't really understand why this jury process is not working for them. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to clear this up a little bit for you tonight. Okay, um, again, we are the Rittenhouse Square Fine Arts Show. We are 95 years strong and our mission is really simple. It is to produce the best art show possible. Um, I, I was talking with some of my board members earlier today, and uh, when we rewrote our mission statement a few years ago, we went back and forth on this for months and months. And in the end, it was just like, this is all we want to do. We want to make an amazing art show for amazing artists. Um, you may wonder, how do we consistently present one of the best ranked shows in the country? And we do that because of you guys. Um, we are selective. We are very selective about who gets invited to shows and we only invite fine artists who submit quality artwork with a professional presentation. Your presentation is just as important as the quality of your work, guys. And we're gonna, we're gonna go into this a lot more. Oh, come on. I apologize because I am running this meeting. It's getting in the way of my, there we go. All right, so first we are gonna talk about how your actual application is scored. Um, most of you have probably applied to shows through this application. There are some of you here who are um, new and you, once you, I'm not going to go into all the details about how to apply with this application, but in the application pro process, you submit your name, your website, your social information, an artist statement, and most shows ask for four images of your artwork and a booth shot. So once our applications are closed, all of our applications are scored by a panel of six jurors. And our jury for our show is a blind jury. And what that means is that our jurors see no information about the artists other than the four images of your artwork that you provide to us and your booth shot. And we can see your, your statement or the jurors can see your statement about your process. So we don't see your names, your website, your social. We don't see pictures of you, nothing. All the jurors see is the artwork that you are submitting to us. And that's, that's what a blind jury process means. Sorry guys, I am not operating at 100% tonight. I had a little cold, so bear with me. If I lose my voice, Sharon's gonna take over for me and, and uh, read the slides. Slide, slide, slide. 
Okay. So our jury pool of the six jurors is a combination of um, professional artists from the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show Board of Directors, all of the, the artists, all of uh, our entire board of directors is made up of professional artists that actually participate in the show. Um, so we're, we're all super vested in making this show the best show we possibly can. And um, we have a good eye when we're looking at artwork. Um, we know what, you know what's good. We know what's going to work with our show. Um, we also invite uh, experts in the art field that are familiar with the Philadelphia area art, area arts community. So the show isn't completely juried by the board of directors. Every show we invite a group of outside professional um, people in the arts field to also jury the work. So we get fresh sets of eyes on the work for every show. Once the jury is complete, jurors are given two weeks to complete their scoring and every application is scored from one to seven, seven being the highest score. Um, our show is a little bit unique in that we don't jury by category. Um, those of you who are familiar with applying to art shows know that when you apply, you apply in a category. My category is mixed media. Um, a lot of the shows across the country will allocate a certain number of slots for each category that's in their show. So if they've got 10 categories and there are 150 artists in their show, they'll allocate 15 spots per category. We have six categories. Our categories are painting, which is oil and, well, we have oil and acrylics, watercolors, drawing, sculpture, mixed media, and printmaking. We don't jury by category. We jury only by quality. So if a hundred artists who happen to be oil painters present the best work to us, then that year our show is going to have a hundred oil painters. So, and we look at your booth shot. Um, this was something that really surprised me when I started jurying shows, how important your booth shot is. Um, in our jury and a lot of juries in, in good shows across the country, your booth show can count for up to 25% of your score. That's a lot. Um, you guys don't need me to tell you that's a lot. There's, you, there's a total of seven points and up to 25% of that is based on what your booth shot looks like. We get a lot of artists who submit beautiful imagery and their booth shot is really not up to snuff. And that, that can really be the difference as to whether or not you're getting into the shows that you would like to participate in. Um, points are deducted or applications may be completely disqualified for not following the application rules. And one thing that I, I wanted to emphasize about this is when shows say that their jury is blind or we are a blind jury, if you um, put a sign with your name on it in your booth shot, that's going to count against you. If there is a picture, if you are like leaning on the corner, you know, mugging it up in your booth shot, that's going to count against you. If you've got, um, you know, a lot of artists have artist bios that explain their work, but it has a picture of them. If that is in your booth shot, that's going to count against you. So the, these are things to really um, take into consideration when you're thinking about how to present your booth shot. Okay. So um, like I said, we have six jurors. They get about two weeks to jury the show. And we're, we're going to show you in further down this um, presentation what that jurying actually looks like. But these jurors look at thousands of images. So after all their scoring is complete, the executive director of our show reviews the jury. The applicants are organized from highest to lowest scores. Oftentimes, um, 
we'll get a group of artists that are kind of in the middle that end up with identical final scores. Like say we have 30 artists who ended up with a four out of seven and that ranked them, if we have 143 spaces in our show, that ranked them between 125 and 155. So that's the difference between getting invited to the show and getting put on the wait list of the show. So when that happens, those artists are re-juried, re-scored, and then re-ranked in, in the places where they were originally. I hope that's making sense. Um, the highest scoring artists are extended an invitation. Uh, we create a wait list of usually around 50 artists. Um, and that is created from the group of the next highest scoring artists. And then if an artist declines our invitation, their space is offered to the first artist on the wait list. So pretty simple, pretty basic. Um, the big lesson in this part is how, I think really how important your boost shot is. Um, before we move on, Sarah, Sharon, are there any, are there any questions, anything I didn't cover about yeah, how the show is juried? One question we got from uh, Moore Deckel is, what is our acceptance ratio? What is our acceptance ratio? Um, it, well, I mean, it, it kind of varies show to show depending on the amount of applications we receive. But I would say on average, our acceptance ratio is around, I'm gonna say like 48, 50%. Does that sound right? I'd yeah. Say maybe, maybe one out of three. Yeah. Um, some of the shows, because we are a fine art only show um, and our, our categories are more limited, um, our application pool is usually a little smaller than shows that accept like fine craft and jewelry. Um, so yeah, I think one out of three is, is pretty good. Any other? Sandy, I wanted, yeah. I wanted to mention uh, for those who joined in late, um, just to ask that you open up your chat window and we're collecting questions in the, in the chat space. Um, so if you, if you jumped on late, open up chat and that's a, a spot where you can enter your questions and they'll, they'll be answered as we go along. Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now what we're gonna do is just give you some things to consider as you are filling out your application. The, the first thing to think about is that, you know, when jurors are reviewing your applications, you have a really limited amount of time to stand out to these jurors. That is not to say that um, the people who jury our show only go through each application once, that is not the case. But the more you can make your application stand out, the cleaner your imagery, um, the, more that, the more that you can make that juror want to know more about you, want to know more about your work, chances are the higher the score you're going to get and the, the better chance you're going to have to get accepted into the shows. Mm. Okay. So this is literally what jurors see in Jap in's application when they start to jury. Um, we jury online these days. You don't, um, you know, years ago, artists used to have to bring their work in and get juried in person. And um, now with the, the benefits of application, we can jury online. Our um, jurors can jury from the comfort of their own homes. But this is what the screen looks like. It's not like big, beautiful imagery moving and jumping in front of you. This is, this is it. Um, this is one of my applications probably from about three years ago. But you can see, you see four little images and you see your booth shot. That's it. This is what the jurors see. They do have an opportunity after they see your work as a cohesive group to zoom in on each image, okay? 
So you re, you re, this is, I cannot stress to you enough how important it is to, to submit quality images, to make sure your images are clean and crisp, um, eye-catching, because literally it's four little boxes and a boost shot on a screen and then a flash of a big image. Okay. Um, INS application, the size limitations are 1920 by 1920 pixels. Um, so just something to think about when you are submitting imagery, if you're submitting really tall vertical images or really longer horizontal images, it makes them harder to see on the screen. Now, that being said, um, we have artists who work exclusively vertically or horizontally. Um, one that I can think of is, is Bruce, Bruce Pizzo does these really long, very skinny horizontal landscapes. And um, his application every year is you really have to zoom in on it to look at it because they're these long, long, skinny pieces. Um, so I am not saying don't submit images that are, that are tall and thin or long and thin, but it is something to consider when you're thinking, I have this one chance to catch the juror's attention. I want to give them the maximum impact that I can. Also, it's a really nice idea. Um, some artists, we, we always strongly suggest you, you crop right to the artwork, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But for some reason, some artists add these black boxes to their imagery when they submit it. That's really not a great plan um, because if you get if you get accepted in the show and and the show wants to use your images for marketing it's just more work for them to have to crop them that's just another little little friendly insight for you so you want to try to find images that represent the best work that you have and make the best use of this 1920 by 1920 size requirement um, these are these are two pieces from another one of our board members, Amy Karstensen. Her work is not always consistently square, but you can see she, two of her of her jury images. She's chosen square paintings, big impact, lots of color. We can see the whole piece. It takes up the screen. So just kind of a, a helpful tip. Um, something else to consider that, that I feel really strongly about, I think this is really important. Do your submitted images reflect your current body of work? And is that body of work actually in your booth shot? Um, I can't tell you how many times we're, look, we're looking at artist imagery and we see these four beautiful pieces of, of work and then you pull up the booth shot and it's a completely different body of work. And what that does is just confuses the jurors. So I think a lot of artists assume if they have a nice booth shot, they can use it year after year after year. Um, I know I did. Um, but you really want to, as your work evolves, as your body of work changes, you want to make sure that, that the work that you're showing to us to apply for this show is reflected in your booth shot. That's something really simple to think about, but really important. And it's it's also some some. I'm sorry. Hold on. Some friendly good advice to not submit the same images year after year after year. It it shows notice. It gets notice. Um, you want to keep it fresh. You want to show the shows that you're growing and developing as an artist. Um, and again, you want the work that you're creating to be consistent with the work that's actually in your booth shot. Do your images show consistency in medium? Um, if you are applying to a show as an oil painter, show them oil paintings. If you're applying as a sculptor, show them sculpture. I know this may sound um, really simple, but 
we as artists, especially a lot of younger artists or artists who are just starting to exhibit professionally, um, want to show a jury everything they can possibly do. You don't want to do that. You want to be consistent. You want your medium to be consistent. You want it to actually be in the category in which you are applying. We want to see like your style, your voice in your work. You want the quality of your images to be consistent across the board. Don't, if you've got three amazing paintings that you want to submit and one so-so painting, don't do it. Finish another amazing painting and give us four amazing images so that when we look at that artwork, um, whether, like if, if I looked at your work, whether I saw it displayed at Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show, in a gallery, in my friend's home, I want to know, I want to be able to say, that's Sharon's work. That's David's work. That's what we mean by consistency. I hope, I hope I'm making sense. I hope this is coming across clearly. And we also added in here subject matter. Um, this is something I don't, uh, it can be important. I don't, I don't really think it's as important as the other three, your medium, your voice, and the quality of your work. We have a lot of artists. Um, Julia Gilmore, who's featured in this picture, is a perfect example. Julia, um, this is part of her artist statement. I paint what I know, what I know, and what I see is a world filled with an intense beauty, even in mundane, everyday objects. So Julia can paint literally she's painted Gumby, um, a bouquet of flowers, uh, a camera. Um, but when you see her work, you know it's Julia's work. So her subject matter isn't always the same, but her voice is always there. You, it's really important to submit a cohesive body of work. And I might sound like I'm repeating myself a little bit, but, but that's okay because <laughs> you guys are here to listen. Um, this is actually our executive director's work, Steve Oliver. Um, it is obvious Steve is a, a wildlife painter. He is a painter of nature. Um, but you can see he, he's chosen four square images, which again, you don't necessarily have to do that, but you can see the consistency in his style, in his technique, in his medium, and, you know, the integrity of the work. If, if I saw a Steve piece, again, in a gallery at our Rittenhouse show um, in someone's home, I would know that's a Steve Oliver. That's what we're looking for. Um, here's another great example of a cohesive body of work. Now, this is another one of our board members. This is Lisa Muller. And I wanted to put this application up here because um, Lisa plays with her subject matter. Sometimes it's figurative. Sometimes it's animals. Sometimes it's nature. She's more of a storyteller. Um, but you can definitely tell even though the subject matters are not the same, the work is consistent, the technique is consistent, her medium is consistent, and the quality across the board is phenomenal. I also wanted to put this example in here because this is a good way to see, Lisa says that she's included a square piece on either end, and then a piece that's probably, I'm gonna guess this is maybe 24 by 30 or those kind of dimensions. And then she's added this, this um, really vertical diptych in here, which is a, a gorgeous piece. But I wanted you guys to see that each image is given the same amount of space on the screen. So with this, this long vertical piece, you don't get to see as much of the detail. But again, another really strong application. Now, I think I'm about to throw myself under the bus here and show you an inconsistent body of work. This is my work, you guys. Um, 
I want to preface this with this is not work that I would submit together to apply to any um, fine art show. When I started um, dabbing my, my toes into the waters of the world of outdoor shows, I would absolutely have submitted these pieces together and then wonder why I wasn't getting into shows. Um, I am an encaustic painter, so I'm usually considered mixed media, but you can see here, I have a, I don't like the word portrait, but for lack of a better word, that's what I'll use. And then I have kind of an abstract floral piece. Now I have two very distinct bodies of work. I work two, I work two bodies of work. Um, I think they look great together, but the, the fact that I'm showing this piece with this abstract floral piece, and then I've got another figurative piece, but it's kind of a gesture. It's more about the line. And then I threw in a drawing because, hey, I want everybody to know I can draw. Um, these are all works created in um, 2021. So, but I would still, and I like each and every one of these pieces, but I would not put them together in an application. I'm mixed media, so I've got no business throwing a drawing in there. Um, having these, these kind of abstract florals with this, you know, portraity figurative work. If people don't know me, if they don't know my work, the jurors are going to go, who is this artist? They're all over the place. Um, there's no consistency here. So even if you think your work is strong, think about how you're presenting it. If you have two separate bodies of work, submit two separate, separate applications. Um, if you want to try to exhibit in sculpture and painting, submit an application for sculpture and then submit an application for painting. Don't try to mix it all into one application. It confuses the jurors. They're not gonna be able to figure out who you are. Make sense? Um, another thing that's really important to consider is, are your images showcasing your work in the best possible way? And I know we've said this before, but in a blind jury, like our show and a lot of the shows across the country, your images are the only thing that the jurors have to go by when they're going to score you. That's it. They, they don't get to see your sparkling personality, your beautiful face. They don't get to read your, um, your artist resume or your CV. None of that. They are looking at your imagery. So you want to present that work in the best possible light. Speaking of light, that was a good transition, if I do say so myself. Um, we're, we're now going to show you some, some examples about things that you should do and things that you shouldn't do. Um, bear with me one sec. I just need to get some water. And again, a lot, a lot of this stuff may seem really obvious, but when you go over and look over your application and your imagery, you're going you're gonna to think about this stuff, trust me. You want to make sure that your images are sharp and in focus. You wouldn't believe the number of applications that we get. And, you know, some of them will turn out to be artists that we know. We know their work and they're beautiful, but their images look terrible. Um, lighting on your images and in your booth shot is critical. You need to make sure you've got good, consistent lighting. You want to crop everything out of your images except the artwork. We don't want to see your frames. We don't want to see it hanging on a wall. Um, all we want to see is the image cropped right to the borders of your work. The only exception to that would be if um, you are a sculptor and that's kind of a physical impossibility or if you're a mixed media artist and the frame is actually part of the artwork then having the frame in it is okay but we really nobody wants to see the frames not when you're during it if you have to incorporate a background like i said if you're a mixed media artist or you're a sculptor keep it simple keep it neutral less is more we want we want the focus to be on your artwork 
on nothing else. Um, it's important, and this is kind of back to lighting, to keep the exposure consistent on all your imagery. And something that um, maybe not easy for artists to admit, not all artists are good photographers. Guys, if, if you're trying to photograph your work and you're not getting into shows and you're, you're looking at your imagery and it's just not cutting it, Consider making an investment in yourself by hiring a professional photographer to, to take your imagery for you. Because if you want to get into shows, you know, that this is your livelihood. This is, this is how we, you know, butter our bread. Invest in yourself and hire a professional photographer if you find that you can't do the work yourself. Or make friends with a professional photographer and trade them for a beautiful painting or sculpture. Okay. Any questions we need to address before we start giving examples? A couple of questions. Uh, one was just about uh, signatures in the work. And then another question about if they change subjects, like they're kind of going in a new direction, then does that constitute like a whole new body of work and how to handle that? Um, signatures are kind of, um, I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that question. I mean, if you sign, everyone's, signs their work. I will say that um, occasionally artists submit work where their signature is so prominent um, that it's distracting, but we can't, we're, because even if it's a blind jury, we're not gonna take points off because you sign your work. Um, but, you know, don't be obnoxious about it. <laughs> How's that for an answer? And the second part was about, um, let's, let's address that second one later. Sure. After we get through the presentation, but that, that's a really good question. And we will get to it, I promise. Um, but let's look, at, let's look at good and bad examples of what we're talking about. Again, this is, this is a piece of my work. This is a photograph I took of this painting, um, you know, at first glance, you may look at this and say, that looks all right. You know, she looks pretty, but the exposure on this is terrible. The lighting on this is terrible. It's not sharp. Um, the frame is still in it and it's actually, it's, it's kind of crooked. So really be, be your own worst critic when it comes to your images. I mean, think to yourself, this is something I like to do when I look at my imagery. Like, is this an image, if I were going to print a coffee table book, or if I were going to um, make a pamphlet to give out at my gallery opening with my imagery in it, is this an image that I would use for that? And if the answer is no, then jurors don't want to see it either. Um, lighting, 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 lighting. Um, this is a sculpture of another of our board members, Lila Terzhansky VR. Um, and you can see this, this is the same piece of sculpture in both of these pieces. They don't even really, other than their shape, they don't even really look like the same piece of work. And the one on the left, my left, um, there's shadows behind it. The work looks shiny. You can see the horizon line back here. Um, again, there's more shadows on the bottom. It's just really distracting. I keep looking at this piece and all I see is like a weird shaped spoon if I'm just glancing at it. But then I look here and I'm like, there is that beautiful sculpture. So this is a, a great example of really good lighting and also being conservative and neutral with your backgrounds on your pieces if you need to have a background. Again, another sculpture um, tip, is it getting lost in the background? We get um, a lot of sculptors applying and you've got huge work, so it's in a natural setting, but you wanna make sure that the, the setting isn't distracting and taking our eye away from your work. So just submit, keep it simple, make that big first impression. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, I'm going to make a song about that. Don't include your framing. 
we don't want to see your framing. We want to see your artwork. As beautiful as your framing is, this is a piece of um, another of our, our board members, Carrie Sacco, who's an amazing, like, impressionistic landscape painter. Um, but when, when this painting is cropped to this frame, all I'm looking at is the frame. That's not to say when this painting is hanging on a wall, that's all you're going to notice. But in a jury setting, I'm so distracted by this gold frame that I'm not really looking at the painting. So crop your work. Don't leave parts of the frame in. Crop that frame out. If you have to, what I, I photograph my work before I frame it, and then I photograph it after I frame it for a reference. So I'm going to show you the same painting crop to the artwork. I mean, look how much more you notice the painting. You see the beautiful texture. You see how she handles the paint. You're looking at these luscious green colors. Sorry, guys. But we don't want to see your frames. We don't want to see walls behind your work. We just want to see the artwork. And you can see like how beautifully photographed this piece is. It's crisp. It's clear. The colors are intense. Make sure that your images are not askew. Um, we, we get submissions where people literally send in a piece that looks like this. Um, a, there's not good light on this piece. The exposure is bad. And then when you look at the, the square box built around this piece, the image is crooked. It's askew. Um, that, that's not going to make you look professional in the eyes of jurors, especially if you want to get into the, the big fine art shows around the country. And these are little things that maybe, you know, if you're not being overly critical, you're not going to notice. You're going to think, oh, that looks good. Um, keep your exposure and your lighting consistent. These are three images that I took. This is some of the, the work I showed you guys before. And you can see this is kind of subtle, but I didn't treat the exposure and the lighting the same in all of these. And you notice when they're next to each other, this, this piece looks like it's in shadow. This piece looks a little grayed out. So the exposure on all three of these pieces on the bottom is the same. It's consistent. Little details are going to make a huge difference. Um, now we're going to go, we're going to talk about boost shots. So there, are there any questions we can address about the imagery specifically before the end or, and, or can everything wait? We're good. Oh, okay. Good questions. We're good. Okay. Awesome. All right. Now we're going to talk about boost shots guys. And again, I cannot stress enough how important your boost shot is. Um, not only does your booth shot give the jurors an idea about the quality of your setup, like how you hang your work, the professionalism of your display? Like, does this person know how to treat their own work? Can this person hang a booth like it's a gallery? Um, but on your end, you need to think about your booth shot as a way to, to, give the jurors a peek at a larger body of your work. Like, you, what an opportunity that that is, because you get to show four images when you, you don't want to crowd your booth shot, but when they see your booth shot, yes, you want that work to be consistent with the work you're showing them, but they're going to get to look at some more of your pieces. I mean, that, that's a huge benefit. Um, and again, like we said before, Make sure the work is consistent with the work that you're applying with. Make sure you keep that boost shot fresh. Don't use a boost shot from five years ago if your work's not the same as it was five years ago. This is just kind of an aside. Um, the, the dome tents, like trim lines, are, the, are tents that are really preferred at an outdoor show. Uh, some shows... Um, they aren't always required, but they usually are preferred. And the reason is that these tents are heavier, they're sturdier, um, they're not going to fly away. They, they make a better, more professional presentation as opposed to easy up style tents. 
they're really not recommended. Some shows will not permit you to display your work with an easy up tent because they are, they're really light, they're less rigid, they bend, um, they're easier to damage. And I can't tell you in a, in a windstorm and at our show, the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show, 95 years strong, um, we're in center city, Philadelphia. We are, we are surrounded by beautiful high rises with, with um, patrons that just wanna come buy our art. But because of those high rises, we're in a wind tunnel and a lot of shows, um, you know, you, you need to think about, is my setup strong enough to withstand wind, rain, dumb frat boys jumping on the side of my tent at night when the show's closed? And you do not want a colored tent, people. Don't buy a colored tent. Um, you want a white tent. Uh, you want your artwork to stand out, your display to stand out, not your tent. So that's just a little helpful hint for newbies. Okay, now we're getting get into some booth shots. This is the booth shot of an artist that applied to our show last year. Um, when you guys apply, you give us permission to use your imagery, and I'm I'm just gonna, I'm going to critique this booth shot. Okay. Um, the first thing that I want to say about this is that this artist's work is stunning. It is beautiful work. Can you see the work in this booth shot? You really can't. You see a lot of work, but you can't really see the work of the artist. There is a huge sign in front of, I've kind of blocked out part of it, right in front of their display. You don't, you know, let the work speak for itself. You don't need a big sign. Um, when you're doing a booth shot, you don't want to have like print bins and tables and clutter in your booth. You want to keep it clean. You want to keep it um, professional and you want us to see the art. Um, this artist has a table with a sign in book and business cards and it looks like greeting cards and and prints, and then just a whole lot of work on the walls, so we can't really see it. They took the picture with a pole, one of their poles, right in the middle of the shot, so it's obstructing the art. There's a sign here, and also it's not cropped right to the booth, so that can make it distracting for jurors. I'm looking at, oh, do I know the artist who's exhibiting back here? I wonder what city this is in. We just want to see the booth. So this is this is an example of an artist who has beautiful, beautiful work, but their booth shot needs some help. And this booth shot um, would have caused them to lose points on their application. Now, here's another booth shot. This is actually Steve Oliver's, one of Steve Oliver's booth shots. Steve is our executive director. He's not feeling well, so he couldn't be with us this evening, but at first glance, you look at this shot and you're like, that's a pretty nice booth shot. But here's the big but, there's a lot of work in this shot. There's, there's work top to bottom, you know, taking up every inch of the walls. That's kind of distracting. I can't really see what the individual pieces are all about. Um, even though it's a nice one, he's got this print bin here that, that could have gotten moved out of the way for the booth shot. Um, he's got his table with his sign in book and stuff in there. When you're, whether or not you, you need that at a show, when you're taking a booth shot, clear the clutter, clear the clutter. I can't stress that enough, but I'll try. Same artist, better booth shot, but still there's a lot of work in this shot. There's, there's just too many paintings and you can, you can see all of his, pricing tags. He didn't crop it um, right to the side of the booth shot. So I'm like, oh, is that a little swan back there? What's what's going on? And you know, this is the guy that he's the executive director of our show. He knows what he's doing. But he needs help on his booth shot. Um, here's an image of a great booth shot. Um, this is Amy Carstensen's work. Um, it's clean. It's cut right 
to the edges of the booth. What do you see when you look at this booth shot? You see her artwork. You don't see clutter. You're not looking on the ground wondering what's going on. Um, you can tell she's she's got a, a heavy duty tent, um, a really professional setup. This is a great booth shot. Simple, clean, no muss, no fuss. Um, another one of our artists. This is, oh my God. My my cold is kicking in. Help me out here. Womack. Womack. Michael Womack. This is Michael <laughs> Womack's work. Um, and you can see this is another great shot. There, you know, there's a little more going on in this shot, but it's still, it's all about the work. Um, you can see his professional clean display. He's got um you know, he's got the structure set up soundly, so you know it's not going to blow away, but it's, most importantly, it's about the work. It's not overpowering, no print racks, no tables, no storage boxes. This is, I don't know if Chris is here with us. He vo he volunteered um, some of his old booth shot. Chris Bonomo is a sculptor, also a member of our board, and he was his work is amazing and his work from this shot to the last shot that I'm going to show you hasn't really substantially changed that much. So this is, I think these are good examples of how important a booth shot is. This shot is terrible. It's wide open. You can see all the booths behind it. Um, his podiums kind of look like they're made out of inexpensive something. There's work all over the place, but most importantly, you can't really see his work in the shot. And this, you know, I think there's a big trash can back here, you know, not great. The lighting is bad. The pieces are hard to see. So he went from this to this, which is much better. Um, you know, he's upped his game on his podiums. Maybe he just painted them black. He's putting less work in the booth, but there's still a lot of work. And finally, this is his latest booth shot. Like, look at the difference. It's the same work. It's the same artist, but he's learned how to present himself in a professional, clean manner. Now, that being said, there's one glaring mistake in this booth shot that um, Chris would lose points for. Does, does any, can anybody in chat tell me what that is? Anybody tell me what's wrong with this booth shot? We have a winner, uh, Patricia, so is the labels and so did uh, another person, DCK. Yeah, not yeah. The, the signs. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not so much the, these labels, but he's got his bio right smack in the middle of it with, what's that? That's a picture of Chris. Um, and even though it's small and it's subtle, that is technically breaking the rules of a blind jury. So it's, it's the little details like that, guys. Like this, you know, compared to where he was, I mean, look at the difference. But still, take that bio shot out. Um, and this is an application that is obviously a little tweak to be super terrible. Um, Carrie's, this is Carrie Sacco's work. I don't know how she gets into her show. No, <laughs> Carrie, was, Carrie was nice enough to make up um, an example of an, of an application that has like everything you could possibly need to get some help on. Um, you can see the images are not cropped to the artwork. They're blurry. Um, they're in the frame. This one is is like leaning crooked. Like we don't we don't want to see images lean against the wall. And you guys take a picture of them, guys. The exposure on this one is way too high. So yeah, I mean, look at that. Would you want to hang this person's work in your gallery? No, you would not. And now this, this is a picture of, um, 
her booth a while ago, which, you know, looks good. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of work on the walls. There's big pricing tags in here, which are really distracting. Um, she did take the time to block out her name on her uh, booth sign. Nothing wrong with having a booth sign. They're awesome at shows, but we don't want to see them in your applications. And then on the bottom of this, we can see all of her storage boxes and, and you know, paint, painting bags, which it's amazing that she had the foresight to create a little hiding area, but we don't want to see it in your booth shot. Take them out, clean it up. And now... This is, this is Carrie's current booth shot. I mean, come on, people. This is what we want to see. It's clean. It's not, even though she's got a lot of work in here, it doesn't feel overly cluttered. It's well lit. It's professional. So, so to go from this to this is the difference in getting into the farmer's market down the street, which there is nothing wrong with selling your work at a farmer's market. I used to do it years and years ago. And getting into shows like the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show, which did I mention in 2020 was voted the number one fine art show in the country. Did I mention that? So this is a great example. This and Chris's examples of how far you can come as you start to learn how to be a professional artist and get an idea about what jurors see when they're looking at your work. Take the time to preview and review your applications. I know a lot of us who do a lot of shows, um, you get really busy, you've got a list of, you know, the deadline for this show is the 15th and this one's the 18th and, and um, when you've been doing this for a long time, it's really easy to go in the night the application's done, throw an application together and hit submit. Don't do that. Take some time and um, Zap, Zapplication has this amazing little feature, oopsie, um, called a preview <laughs> button. Uh, and if you hit that button, you're going to see like what we showed you earlier, what the jurors see when they're looking in the back end as application. So you can um, change your images. You can rearrange your images if you think one image looks better next to another one. Um, you can consider how your booth shot actually looks with the work that you've submitted, that you've applied to the show with. Double check your information. Um, it's as simple as check in your spelling. Make sure that your website URL is correct. I can't tell you how many artists send us a URL for their website. And when they've gotten accepted into the show and we're updating our Rittenhouse Square website and their, their links don't work, um, you know, just check. Check your spelling. Check, your, check how your um, artist statement sounds. And really importantly, make sure that you actually reviewed and followed the show rules. I know it's also really easy to just glaze over those rules and say, here's my images, here's my booth shot, here's my 30 bucks, I'm done. But take a little extra time, especially if you're not get, getting into the shows that, that you think sh you should be accepted to. Take that extra time. Take, make sure when you fill out your application, you're giving yourself an extra 15, 20 minutes to review it before you hit send. It can make all the difference in the world, guys, like all the difference. So just quick recap before we open it up for Q&A. Um, oh, this, is, this was going a little longer than I thought it would. This we were supposed to end a minute ago. So we'll hurry it up. Um, Problems, images not cropped to the art, poor image quality. Um, your images aren't cohesive and lack a clear voice or aesthetic. Um, as we just saw, booth issues, um, you know, submitting images that have all this stuff in the booth that are distracting from the art and your presentation. You want those jurors to look at that booth and see this artist knows how to hang, hang their art. This artist knows how to display their work professionally. 
we want this artist to hang their work in our show. Um, don't put other work from other categories in your application. Um, like I was saying, if, if you want to show sculpture and painting, put in two applications. If you have two separate bodies of work, like the, the um, fake application I showed you of my work, submit two applications with the separate bodies of work so that you look consistent, that your voice is consistent. Lighting is so important. I hope if nothing else, you guys have learned that lighting is super important in your booth on your images. And on booth shots, sometimes shots taken from an odd angle um, are not as effective as a head-on booth shot. I used to, I know, take a lot of um, booth shots. If I had a corner booth at a show, I would want to show that corner because I thought, oh, then then this show is going to know I can handle a corner. This show is going to see um, how much more work I have. And, you know, it's just distracting to so simple, clean, concise. All right. Um, we are going to give, if any of you guys were, were doing something super awesome for you, if there are any of you who have already submitted an application to either our June or September show for 2022, and after watching this presentation tonight, would like to review, rev review or um, review your application or maybe double check your imagery to make sure it's it's the best you can possibly be sending us. Um, if you send an email to info at rittenhousesquareart.com, which will go to Steve Oliver, our executive director, he will this one time change your status from received to incomplete. And what that is going to do is going to give you the ability to go in and re-edit your application with us. So if anyone's already submitted and you want to review your app, send Steve an email, info at rittenhousesquareart.com. The contact page on our website, uh, Rittenhouse Square Art, also um, has an email form, and that also goes to Steve at info. So to reiterate, the deadline for our June 2020 show, which is June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, is coming up. It's January 17th um, at midnight Eastern Standard Time. That's when our, the applications close for good, excuse me. And the applications for our September show, which is 16th, 17th, and 18th, close on March 7th at midnight Eastern Standard Time. And again, those applications are on zapplication.org. Um, our artists love our show. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. It's a, the, the patrons, that look forward to, to our June and September show every year are so, they're, they're art lovers. They are so educated that the people come to that show. It's, it's not a show where there's gonna be 100,000 people walking the square, but the people that are there are there because they wanna buy art and they, they support the show. We've been there for 95 years. We're, we're a tradition in the city of Philadelphia. So, now that you guys have all watched this amazing presentation, you totally got this, right? Okay. All right. Um, that's all we got for you there. So now we are running a little late. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Sarah if there are any um, questions that we haven't been able to answer in the presentation. Yeah, we had a couple of great um, on the booth shot, um, kind of kind of wrapped up in the same theme. A couple of people were asking, like, "Hey, you know, if I haven't, you know, gotten to do shows before and I don't have a booth, what do I do?" And another question that kind of dovetails with that is, "Can I just do a virtual booth if I don't have an actual physical tent?" And so, uh, wondering what kind of guidance you would offer on that. The advice that I would give is, I mean, if, if you're just starting out, like maybe you're transitioning from a student artist to a professional artist, we will accept shots of like your work in a, in a gallery setting. Um, but just be aware 
that if you get accepted into this show, you are going to have to have a professional display. So what some artists will do is um, set up their booth in their yard. Um, if you want to get into the world of outdoor shows and you don't have the tent yet, you don't have the pro panels yet, but you are intending to buy them with all the, the riches that you're going to make at the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show. Um, you know, artists are friendly people. Reach out and see if you, you can borrow someone's setup. And I, it's, it's very much preferred that you actually set it up and take the photographs as opposed to creating a virtual booth. As good as most of us can be at Photoshop these days, we can tell. Um, and again, you know, if you're accepted into the show and you, you show up and your display looks nothing like what you applied with, um, you can be asked to leave the show. So it's better to send us a note, let us know, like, I'm new, um, I'm planning on investing in a 10, I'm going to get some pro panels. This is, this is the best I can do for a booth shot. Um, you know, we, we love young artists. We love up and coming artists. We like to work with people. So my advice is try to connect with other artists, maybe borrow some stuff, get advice, look for stuff used, but do your very best to take a real booth shot, whether it's in your backyard or not, as opposed to just virtually creating one. What and was the other part of that? A couple more questions. Um, one of them, um, was with regard to maybe doing a booth shot indoors. I know I had to do that sometimes when it was a wintry time of year and I did something indoors. I think, you know, the important thing is just to pay attention to your lighting so that it doesn't distort the colors in your work. Um, and then one other question kind of goes back to the body of artwork. Uh, one person's asking if an artist sends in two applications for two separate bodies of work and is accepted in both or just one, like how would that work? Um, I, I think that's going to vary show to show with our show. If you want to um, have a booth and display, um, Chris Bonoma, the sculptor, is a, a perfect example of this. Um, Chris is an oil painter and also is a sculptor. So when he wants to exhibit both bodies of work at, the sh at our show, he sends in an application for each, one application for sculpture, one application for painting. If you are accepted in both categories, you'll still have one space, but you're allowed to show both bodies of work. But you cannot exhibit work at our show um, in a category in which you are not accepted. That answer the question? Okay. Do we have any other? And those are the those are the main questions at this point from the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, well, it, we were going to close up at eight. It's eight ten. I I'm I'm willing to stay on for like another five minutes if if anyone feels like they've got a question that they didn't answer get answered or wanted some advice from maybe one of our board members. I see John. You want to um, go ahead and unmute yourself? Did you have a question? Oh, I think you're saying thank you. And if you are, you're so welcome. <laughs> you are so welcome. All right, we, ha we have a couple minutes here, you guys. We've, we've got like five of our board members here. We've got a wealth of information. If anybody's got any more questions, we're happy to try to answer them. Hi, so... My name's Matt. Can you see me or hear me? Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hi. Um, so I had um, bought some panels that weren't pro panels. Do you suggest that we get the pro panels? The, the things I bought were like this chain link fence looking kind of thing. Um, one of your examples had those in it. Mm -hmm. And then your better example, I think it was uh, Sacco's work. Um the better example had the pro panels. Is that something that's completely necessary? I think my advice to me, to, to you, and maybe I'll, I'll let either like Sarah or, or David Oleski, he's here too, and take this, is just like with anything, just like with uh, the paints that you buy, get the best that you can afford 
and do the most with it that you possibly can. Um, you know, we, we totally understand, especially when, when you're starting out, whether, you know, whether you're 25 or you're 45, um, having a, 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 having the booth set up that you saw in a lot of these final shots is not an inexpensive endeavor. So, um, you know, looking for things used, there's a lot of groups like Artist Garage Group on Facebook where you can buy things used. Um, I am my, my Sarah, David, any Sharon, anybody yeah. want to add to that? The shows are, you know, especially the better quality shows like ours and some of the others uh, throughout the country, you know, it's, it's tiny little gradations that will make a distinction. So try to do the best you can. I mean, we recognize that not everybody can do top, top quality stuff right off the bat. I mean, I couldn't. It took me a while until I could afford to buy a set of pro panels. Uh, but just try to do the best you can because recognizing that sometimes it's that little extra effort that can make the difference. And as Sandy mentioned, if you're not already familiar with it, um, there is a Facebook group called the Artist Garage uh, Group where you uh, use display equipment. In fact, I'll actually be listing a set of pro panels there myself this spring. And you can pick up things now, especially with supply chain shortages, you can pick up things for like half the cost is what it would cost to buy new and maybe not even pay freight if you can pick things up or meet the artist halfway. So there are ways, you know, you don't have to be uh, shut out by having to think that you got to buy everything brand new and shiny. That's definitely not the way to do it. I've had to buy a lot of used things in my time as a career, and it makes it makes a big difference. Yeah, Sandy. I would, I would also... um, Sandy. Oh, sorry, Sharon. I'm my video is off, but um, this is this is Carrie. This is Carrie. Um, Taco, by the way, you guys. I, you know, so my my images were featured here, and. The, the main thing I wanted to say is, yes, we are the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show presenting this, but um, you have to understand there, like across the board, there are a lot of outdoor shows that um, you cohesively as a group can consider uh, entering. They, they can be something from like a one day show, a two day show, locally, regionally, nationally. So what I had started out with was certainly those grid wire graphic display systems. Yeah, me and too. <laughs> they are wonderful. Mine break into two panels. Um, I still have them. I still maintain them because I um, lend them out to some of our groups that... Um, you know, like our, our nonprofits and stuff. Um, and they were, I started off with four of those. Then I went to nine of those and I had uh, covers created for them. So for some of the smaller sh one day shows, they might be something to consider, but the whole outdoor show circuit which we all are striving to become, um, you know, we, we consider ourselves professionals now. That was just an investment that I chose to make. And I, am, I don't look back. It was one of the best things I ever did. I bought my um, whole pro panel set up, used from an artist that was retiring from the outdoor show circuit. So, that those two two different setups worked well for me for a certain set of shows. And then when I chose to upgrade to the next level and to apply to the next level of sh outdoor shows, that's why I went with pro panels. So if, if, you know, you just have to judge what you're, you know, investing in and, also, another thing that I chose to invest in was like a better camera to, to take pictures of my work. I, I worked on what the, like a editing software that I was going to edit my photos with. So those are just all different things. You know, maybe you have like a, you know, a 17 year old or God, like a 14 year old 
relative that can edit your photographs for you better, but it's just all what you want to choose to do. So that's all that I wanted to say. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Very quickly. I just dropped a link into that Facebook group on the chat. And so there's a link there to the uh, used awesome. equipment called the uh, artist garage group. And so you can scoop up that link there. And I mean, almost weekly, you'll find sets of pro panels available for sale. And if it's something in your region, it's definitely a lot less expensive than starting new. And there's also um, the mesh panels. What are the, I haven't used them in so long. What are they? Are they the fusion yeah. panels? Yeah, the Flourish, Flourish mesh panels. Yeah, I've Flourish. used those for many years and um, they work fine. Um, I've, I've gotten, I got into top shows with those. As long as you have, you know, the cohesiveness in your work on a good lighting, um, they, they are fine. And in fact, a lot of people prefer them because they're and unwieldy as the pro panels and so depending if you're doing shows solo or with a helper um that can also be a determining factor yeah and they're they're the setup time with those and if one of you guys can put a link to those in the chat too that might be helpful um i know like david you use those up until probably a couple of years ago and you just switched to pro panels and you've been a professional for what 30 years yeah, I went through a bunch of different incarnations of my display. Um, one that was really effective was just eight foot by 10 foot tarps in a nice color with grommets in it and stretch it tight just to give a solid color mm. backdrop for the artwork. So just visually it was really effective, um, but it was just a tarp. And, you know, it had a nice, it looked like a sail, which was a really nice look. It was the same color both sides. So if I hung on the outside, it still looked good. But, uh, you know, the writing was on the wall. I think anytime you try to save money, just keep in mind, you're probably going to just go ahead and buy the better version or the best version as soon as you can, whether it comes to your display, the canopy, your chair, you know, everything, you're probably going to upgrade. So keep that in mind. If you think you're saving money, you're probably going to wind up just buying it again, possibly right away as soon as you realize your mistake and that your improvement will, you know, it'll be huge immediately as soon as you get better display equipment. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's an investment in yourself. And, and I know I, I can say that when I finally made the leap and, and bought a nicer display, almost immediately, not immediately, like in a week, but it paid for itself. Um, so I it might, to, I it might add, seem like a lot of money, but it's it, it'll pay for itself. Go ahead, Sharon, I want, sorry. I wanted to add something um, as we're talking about all these different solutions of, of tents and, and, and panels and um, you begin to consider lights and um, there are a lot of things that uh, that are that can be um, investments that certainly um, help the appearance of your work, and that's what this is all about. I would um, I would really recommend that you walk shows um, and check mm. out what everyone is doing. Um, you know, you'll learn from everyone else's displays, um, and not just the um, you know just just observing, but you know in conversations you'll find that um, your, your fellow artists will be more than happy to you know, tell you um, uh, what they use, what their choices are, um, what you might consider if you're just starting out. Um, so don't, you know, don't, be, um, don't be worried about uh, a, a big investment right away. Um, be, um, be smart about your choices and just like you're doing tonight, um, in, you know, uh, listening and, and, and learning, um, you walk the shows and meet the artists and you'll learn a, a, a whole lot more. Yeah. That's a really good point, Sharon. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I w I would say 95% of the artists that I've met since I've started doing outdoor shows are like friendly, open, um, here to help each other kind of people it's very rare that you're going to walk up to an artist and and you know ask for a little advice that you're going to get a cold shoulder um especially at our show because our artists are amazing they're what make our show so amazing another good idea is also you know if if you're not ready to apply for our show yet this year um volunteer Come and volunteer during the show. And, and that's another great way to get to know the artists and to really see 
what, you know, it's a, it's a really good way to see what doing outdoor art shows is really all about. Um, so maybe if you're kind of on cusp, like, I don't know if I want to do volunteer at our show. Um, I think the link is up on our website, right, Carrie? If, if you would want to consider volunteering, you know, not just our show, other shows too. It's a great way to, to get to know the industry. All right. Um, anything, um, is it L Limor? Limor? Yes, it's Limor. Limor. Um, I have a question. I, I have a good booth shot, um, but it has, um, it has the, the prints racks in them. So should I retake, reset it up and take a picture without them? Or is it not a terrible thing to have? Yes. <laughs> if you want my honest answer, it is, it's going to be worth your time to set the, and, and take a new, or, um, you know, wait until you're, you're already set up and you've got it looking sharp. And then, um, you know, all the shows have a little break where there's a, you know, that 15 minutes where no one's around, take your print racks out, get a new booth shot then. But I think, um, you know, if, if, if it's not realistic for you to set the whole thing back up and take another shot, I would, you know, wait until one of your first shows of the year and, and cause it, it is important. It makes a big difference. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're 23 minutes over our cap. So if the, it, we've got time for maybe one more, if anyone else would like to ask a question, I'm not seeing anyone. So, all right. Well then again, I, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, we're super happy. We had such a great turnout. Um, I hope you guys learned something. We are going to try to take this recording and put it up on the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show YouTube channel, which we're trying to build. So you guys all need to subscribe to that. And if you haven't already, please, um, you know, subscribe to our, get on our email list. Um, go on our, our website and sign up to get our emails. It's a great way to stay current with what we're doing with the show and to find out about um, seminars like this that we're having just to give you guys some information. Um, and again, like Sharon was saying, you can reach us. The, the info at rittenhousesquareart.com goes to Steve Oliver, our director. But if you guys have questions, um, you want to reach out looking for some help, looking for a little guidance, shoot us an email. We're friendly people. Um, we're happy to help. We love supporting the arts community. So on that note, I'm going to thank you guys once again for coming. I love seeing, being able to see everybody's faces. June show application closes January 17th. I hope every single one of you applies and I hope every single one of you gets in. Thanks guys.